So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, March the 17th, and this is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 200. That's right, 200 weekends of backyard beekeeping information responding to your questions. So thank you so much for being here. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. So what's going on outside? Well, it's raining and it's windy. So what's the temperature? 49 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 9.5 Celsius. It's raining. 25 mile an hour wind gusts, that's 40 kilometers per hour. So I'm glad that you're here. If you wanna know what we're gonna talk about, please look down in the video description below and uh, you'll see all the items, all the topics in order with references and links as necessary. There's also going to be an announcement at the end. Um, don't jump to that. Don't you, don't fast forward. <clears throat> but there is going to be an opportunity to win some stuff in celebration of the 200th episode. I really didn't know what to do, so we're just giving stuff away and uh, design some merchandise for uh, the 200th episode. That's all, it's really that simple. So we're gonna keep right on going for a long time apparently. And uh, if you want to know how to turn in your own question for consideration, uh, please follow the link in the video description and it takes you to my website, which is thewaytobe.org. And there's a page there called The Way To Be. This is also a podcast, so if you're driving or working or doing something where you can't look at a screen, it's on Podbean. And it's also titled The Way To Be. So you can listen. There's a whole list there, by the way. It's a playlist that goes on for 200 episodes, apparently, or more. So anyway, the first question comes in from Emil. Hey Fred, if you need to remove deep frames of honey during spring to create space, can you store them in a garage or shed in a hive butler with the vented lid? If so, how long would you be comfortable leaving them there? I know you could put them in a freezer, technically. Honey does not freeze, so I imagine you are guarding against pests getting into the honey. Okay, so that's uh, storage questions. A lot of people are going to be opening up their hives in spring and they're going to be finding out that some of their bees are dead or that there's a huge surplus of honey. And that's why springtime when a new nectar flow comes on is a great time to remove the honey that was in there over the winter time, assuming it hasn't crystallized. And usually it hasn't. Uh, and then you want to store it. Why not just leave it on the hive? If you leave it on the hive, when the new nectar flow kicks in, the bees really don't use it. You know what they use? The new stuff coming in. So the new nectar that comes in, new pollen and everything else is what they're going to use. So it is a good time to rotate that stuff out. If you put it into storage, the hive butler that's described here is a great tote to use. But um, Emil also mentioned the screen top. The screen top is for transporting live bees. So I don't recommend using that for storing your honey. And uh, when you store your honey, you want to make sure that it doesn't get condensation on it. So hot days, cold nights, and storage. You want to make sure that uh, when you come into the following morning that uh, moisture doesn't collect on the surface of your honey. Because guess what can happen? Even with capped honey, it can take on moisture. So we don't want to ruin that. One of the ways to stop that is by putting desiccant packs in there. And uh, desiccant packs, there's a company called Wise Dry, and they're rechargeable. That's right, you take them out, you put them in your microwave and uh, run them through a couple of cycles and they're good to go again and they have color-coded beads in them that get dark as they get used up, so they tell on themselves. Uh, another reason that I don't want you to put them in open vents like that, when it's honey that you plan to use or recycle back to the bees, that's an option too. Uh, later when they need it, if there's a dearth or something like that. We don't want uh, other bugs to be able to get to them. So a screen top, I would save that for actual transporting of bees and collecting swarms and things like that, because that's what that's for. The solid tops, I think, would be much better. And uh, that's pretty much it. I do caution you, uh, for a lot of people that put deep frames in the Hive Butler totes, uh, because they hold 10 deep frames, it's a lot of weight. And remember that those totes, even though it's a really strong plastic, they do have the potential to bow out a little bit, especially when it gets really hot outside and things like that. So another thing I recommend you do with that tote is put a shipping strap around it. So when you've got your tote here and the frames are running this way, 
put your ship, shipping strap around this way, cinch it up, and that just makes sure that it holds its form really good. We don't want any of the frames to slip down and fall into the bottom of that or to bow it out over several weeks or months. So that's about all I have for that. Desiccant, keep it dry and uh, store it somewhere where it doesn't get also really hot. You don't want it to get too hot and potentially melt the wax. So you don't want to put it out in a shed that gets a lot of sun. So you might want to put it in your basement, something like that. Not bad. Okay, question number two comes from Emma in the UK. Hi, this is a subject most people would say requeen, but I'm wondering if the genetics of this queen may be worth keeping. I caught a swarm nine months ago and they had been sat on the branch for five days, unable to find a new home. I caught and hived them, fed from the beginning. They never grew, they maintained themselves and have come through winter and they're still small, but healthy. Also, my other half is really attached to them, so would you try and increase their numbers? And if so, how would you ignore their survival instincts and move on? Or would you ignore their survival instincts and move on? Thanks. Okay, so here's the thing. This is the beauty of backyard beekeeping. I'm a huge fan, personally, of the really tiny underdog colonies, late season swarms in particular, things like that. You know why? I hive them anyway. If you have the equipment, what do you have to lose? You put them in there. We're not bee breeders, you know, even though it doesn't mean we want to keep bad stock, like diseased stock, but a small cluster of bees that made it through winter, that shows some durability in those genetics, I would say. So for me personally, backyard beekeeping, I would keep them. Now, one of the reasons that sometimes these small colonies don't do well and they don't build up very fast, when you get a, especially a late season swarm, if we put them in too large of a box, so I recommend if you don't already have one, if you could get them, or you might even consider putting in what's called a follower board in a long Langstroth or horizontal hive configuration. Some people put in spacers in their deep eight or 10 frame Langstroth boxes just to consolidate them down and move them to the middle so that uh, they have a smaller space to deal with, which means they control the climate better, which means they can do more with fewer bees, if that makes sense. Sometimes when we put them in too large a space, for some reason, they lose their inspiration to expand and develop and grow out in there. And I've seen this over and over through the years where a colony, because I used to do this, whether it was a package of bees, uh, whether it was a swarm, no matter what, you know what, I just went and I put them straight into my 10 frame deep box or an eight frame deep root box. And then I just figured, well, they have the space and they'll just eventually fill it out. Most of the time they did. And so they made it because we put sugar syrup on there, one-to-one -one sugar syrup, just to keep them going and make sure like if we get rain, they need to be able to get that uh, energy resource, the carbohydrate inside the hive when they can't fly out because they need that to generate warmth. And every bee is kind of pulling double duty because there aren't a lot of them. So the smallest space we provide, they tend to do better. And I found that out when I put them in nucleus highs, five frame deeps. And uh, when I started doing that, they did better. The smallest colonies, underdogs, colonies that you would never think would make it. Now, if you do that, if you reduce the space and you provide for them, you give them the nectar, you know, imitation nectar, which is just sugar syrup. Uh, when you give them everything you think they need, Single entrance, a small entrance is very important for a small cluster too. Uh, sometimes a colony of bees that's undersized that has a large entrance will abscond because they don't feel that they're protected, that they can defend it. So I recommend a small nuke, five frames. And if you have a resource frame that you can put in there with them to help them out, I would. And uh, <clears throat> see how they do because I've found that small colonies built much faster in small hives. And I think sometimes in the wild, some of these um, bee trees and cavities and things like that, that I've recently starting two years ago, putting an endoscope in to see if I could see kind of how big the cavity is, doesn't work out very well because you encounter a bunch of bees and you can't really see the entire interior space. So, but Sometimes they seem to occupy very small cavities in trees. So, and then they do very well, but then they swarm a lot. But years are kind of stagnant, but we're coming into spring. 
please let us know how it works out, but I recommend one of those two options. Either get a nucleus box and rehive them in that, or find some way to fill the additional space that you have in your larger box and uh, close it up to give them the equivalent of a five frame nucleus box. And then let us know how it goes. But I would keep them. You have nothing to lose. Backyard beekeeper. And uh, just think of how good you're going to feel if they really do start brooding up and building. So I think uh, you have nothing to lose to do that. Question number three comes from Laurel from Lindhurst, Illinois. I've seen a video of someone using a double-sided foil insulation piece like a cloth cover. Do you have any comments on this? Also, do you have a video showing how you constructed your hive stands from fence posts and the two by fours? Okay, so, well, the second part of that, there'll be a link down in the video description of how to use iron T posts to put up a hive stand. And that works great because driving T posts into the ground gets them below the frost level, below the frost line. Uh, so they're really stable and they don't heave in spring, which is what we have going on right now. A lot of ground movement. So they don't respond to that. Plus, what I put on, it mentions here, 2x4s. I don't put 2x4s on them. Now I use um, galvanized metal conduit. So it's designed for electrical conduit. usually comes in 10-foot lengths. And then you can cut that down with a hacksaw or you can use what's called a pipe cutter. And better yet, if you go to the home center and you know you want it to be only six feet long or eight feet long, or you buy a 10 footer and you just cut it in half and make two five footers out of it, uh, they'll cut that for you at the store if you want to. Also ask them to dress the ends so that they're not sharp. But I'll put a link down for that. But as far as this foil, um, I've seen people use it and we know that double bubble, I'm pretty sure that's what we're talking about. But I'm just gonna use as an example here, this is my nucleus box. If you notice, these nukes, along with a lot of other hive designs that have the migratory covers, this is a migratory cover. So when you put, and look, there's propolis on it, there's a little bit of burr comb on there, and then this just lays on here, which doesn't look very secure. You put this on and this is your cover. So there's no inner cover. When you have a standard Langstroth box, the outer cover is a telescoping cover that goes down on the sides and everything, but look at this open seam right here. And this isn't the end of the world. This is what's on all of my nucleus hives, but I also have an insulated cap on them. But I'm actually glad this question was asked. The reason is, uh, if you look at University of Guelph, uh, you look at their videos and you'll notice that uh, when Paul is giving his demonstrations there, he pulls up a piece of uh, heavy muslin cloth or sometimes it's a heavy cotton duck. And I have that too. And you can lay them on here and the advantage of that over this, I'll tell you what it is is that because it is a heavy cloth like a canvas, the bees propolize it, which means they're helping to build a, you know, a propolis envelope, which then helps uh, protect the hive. Look how this reflected light looks. Anyway, so the foil face, this is double bubble. Now the interesting thing about this is, so if you've got a migratory cover, yeah, you could put it right on there. And the bees will also glue it to the backs of these frames. Now you might be thinking if you put this on there, the bees can't really go over the top of these frames anymore, right? But then I was looking closely at the way um, the nucleus hides are built. Look at the space above it. There really isn't bee space. What is bee space? Three eighths of an inch. So there isn't enough room already for them to go over the top. So when we're using a nucleus hive, the bees, in order to get from frame to frame, they either have to go underneath the frames or around the end. So if you put this on, double bubble, there's a couple of things that happen. One, it serves as a gasket. So if you get rainstorms and wind and things that are going on like we're having right now, put this on here and it creates a seal, right? So we have a seal right here of this double bubble material. It's aluminum face. It's a foil face, however they want to call it. Sometimes there's a product called Reflectex. But so what's it do? 
the seals have vents all through the top. There is no top venting when we talk about uh, the migratory covers. And they can strap them down. And when you strap it down, it creates the seal even tighter. Now that thin piece of uh, Reflectex or Double Bubble, whatever the trade name is, and you can get them at any building center, uh, that is worth an R1.1 by itself. Now the way that stuff really works well is when there's an air gap between it and you stop the air movement, it traps the air because that's it. trapping air and keeping it from transmitting heat or cold is uh, how we insulate. But that little piece gives you double the insulation value of that pine that's on there because that pine cover is three quarters of an inch. Guess what the R value is of that? Three quarter inch pine? 0.71. So if we put the double bubble up there, we added 1.1. So that's just like having a big thick piece of wood on top, plus the benefit of sealing airflow off, which means that the bees inside uh, can keep themselves warm easier. So I'm kind of a fan of it. I can't say I've used it though. So if you try it, I think um, Ian Stepler, uh, Canadian beekeepers vlog, he uses some kind, I don't know if it's foil face, but I've seen his winter inspections when he comes in the spring and he's always peeling back some kind of bubble insulation in there. And I don't know if it's Reflectex or double bubble or what it is. It did look like some of the bees were chewing it. Some of it appeared chewed up because it was underneath feed, I think. Uh, so if I noticed my bees chewing it apart and uh, getting into it and chewing into the, the foil facing and stuff like that, I think I would stop using it. So. I don't want my bees chewing plastic. So if that happened and they started to damage it because they're trying to get rid of it, I would go back to putting some kind of inner cover on there that is thicker, more insulated, and that the bees could not chew. But uh, yeah, I think it's worth trying, but you want to keep an eye on it. But I think I could see some advantage to that. Question number four, Kevin from uh, New York. March 11th, Zone 5B, Central New York, and today my partner and I made an odd discovery. On the landing board of one of our hives was a pristine drone. You could tell it had left the hive that day and was dying on the landing board. In my warm hand, it began to move so it hadn't been exposed to freezing cold for too long. I searched our other four hives to see if there were any drones and I only found, four, only found workers who had flown out to leave the hive to die in the snow. The hives have Be Smart inner covers, emergency sugar, and double bubble secured around the seams. We haven't had any, swarms, any warm spells that have lasted longer than a day, and there is no pollen anywhere. The red maples won't bloom until next week above freezing. Is it possible the queen in one of my hives started laying drones in mid-February? Why would she do that? We have a month of nights in the 20s still to go. Okay, well, that's rougher weather than we have. A month still in the 20s yet to go. So in Northwest PA, we're doing pretty good. Uh, we have warm temps coming ahead. So the bees can do cleansing flights and things like that. But here's the thing. Why would you have a drone now? So let's look at how long drones live anyway. So when would that drone have had to be produced? It is rare to have them have drones this time of year. So I think a couple of things could be possible. So there's no absolutes on this, but maybe it's a drone that just happened to live really long. This is the end of its life. But the description is pristine, young looking. Okay. The other thing is look at the size of the drone. And the reason I say that all drones are not the same size. So this can tell you something about the drone. So if you didn't get rid of it, you can actually measure its thorax. Uh, if you had a laying worker, let's say something happened to your queen, you lost the queen, you know, four weeks later, you've got some worker bees that activated their ovaries and they started laying eggs. And then after that, see, that would mean that if they started laying three weeks after the loss of the queen, and then once they lay the eggs, how long does it take a drone to emerge? You know, you're another 24 days after that, so now we've got drones potentially from laying workers, but guess what they would be? Smaller than the normal drones are laid by queens. So this is another way that we can break it down because they, the workers, the laying workers will lay their eggs in every cell, which means they lay their eggs in worker cells, which is why we call them bullet cells. The capping on the cell bulges way out and that's because it's undersized 
for drone production, but it's a laying worker. So the laying worker drones are actually smaller than the queen's drones that she would lay in drone cells, which are larger and then we get those nice big fat drones. So they're visibly different. So that's one thing to look for, the size of that drone that came out, laying worker. And you do also have the potential for a queen that for some reason or other is at the end of her life or she's not completely fertilized and, or she's just laying drone eggs for no reason. But here's my concern about that is, why would the workers tolerate it? Because the workers are in charge. And if a queen went around in a period where they're not productive, and she were producing eggs in drone cells this time of year, and uh, the, the hive is not adequately provisioned, then they're gonna be in there removing those eggs, and they even eat them. So the nurse bees are in charge of that. I can't think of a reason why they would tolerate a drone. So the likelihood that it's an old drone, right? 12 weeks, kind of the max on them. So, you know, we're pretty far along, I think, to have one that lived this long, that was produced normally in the fall and just managed to avoid all the hunting and scavenging that goes on that the workers do when they're driving out drones in winter. Um, I'm thinking if it's a big fat drone, you've got a laying queen, uh, but that means that the workers are also putting up with that, but they could be desperate in the absence of other brood because they're gonna maximize their resources towards worker brood. They're gonna hold back their resources from surplus brood, which is would be the drones. They don't need them. It's the wrong time of year for it. They're very efficient with the resources. So you might be queenless with a laying worker. What you do find out when the weather's warm and you pull things apart and you finally inspect the brood, and if you find that there's nothing but drones in there, then we have our answer. You probably have a laying worker. Uh, so I hope that when you do find out, when you can inspect, that you're going to find out what's going on. Obviously you can't do it now because the weather is so bad and there's no benefit in exposing all your bees because if it is a, just a mistake, just happens to be one drone, here's another thing I would watch for. Healthy worker bees that don't look worn out because if they have a, a cycle, a continuing cycle of new brood in there of workers, then you'll see fresh looking workers on the landing board when they're doing cleansing flights. In fact, when they do cleansing flights and they're landing in the snow and stuff like that, you can examine those bees. Do they look young? Are they in great shape? Are their abdomens nice and full? Are they well provisioned? If they are, then you have a colony that's still potentially making it. So then you're not going to have all of your answers until you get to a warm day when you can pop the lid on that hive and look at the brood and see what's going on. I would not do it just for the sake of knowing right now. But those are some possibilities. There's no absolute on that uh, issue. Question number five comes from Vit, V-Y-T-B-B-B. Fred, is it a bad idea to do inspections early in the morning, like 6 a.m.? Talking about summer season, I need to avoid inspections while neighbors are outside. Okay, um, I don't think it's a good idea to do inspections uh, on your hive early in the morning for a lot of reasons. And I understand, so the neighbors are, might be outside, but here's what goes on early in the morning. Usually it's cool early in the morning and you're at a disadvantage. Uh, when you're going to open the hive, it's kind of darker. The sun is at a lower angle. Uh, all the bees are likely inside the hive, with the exception of those that were spending the night out on plants and trees and things like that. Some foragers end up out at night and then they come back the following morning. But uh, you're dealing with a maximum number of bees. You have the lowest visibility because all the bees are inside. So when you want to look at frames and things like that, uh, you have too many bees on them. So if you did your inspections anytime from noon on, so noon to 3 p.m., then uh, the sun is higher. You have better visibility looking into the cells. Most of your foragers are out unless the weather's bad. And if the weather's bad, windy, cloudy, rainy, you shouldn't be in there anyway because that's also when your bees can be cranky and that's when you put your neighbors in jeopardy when cranky bees are flying around and you get the one or two. It doesn't take very many. The one or two angry guard bees that go around and just feel like stinging someone. So I don't know how close your neighbors are, but the way you manage your bees is far more important, I think, than um, the time of day that you're doing it. So I don't think inspecting early in the morning is your solution to keeping bees from going after neighbors. And here's why. 
if you make your bees upset in the morning because you're inspecting, your likelihood of smashing bees is higher because there's more bees in the way. You smash a couple of bees, you get some angry bees. How long are they angry for? Sometimes for the rest of the day. Me, for example, uh, if I have, you know, people coming over for portrait photography, because we do a lot of photography, and if people are coming and we've scheduled something here on my property, I don't even look at any of the hives that day. And that's because, you know, for the rest of the day, we have the potential for just a few of the guards to zoom around and they're still a little uptight that maybe you did something and they're annoyed by you, which means they go after anybody. And the more afraid people are, new people are, perfumes, uh, scents in their hair, things like that can make them angry. So I think I would just go in favor of the bees. The best time to look in them when you get the best look, when you have the best lighting, when it's the warmest outside and uh, when you can move carefully through the hive. And so your conduct while you're inspecting the bees is going to have the most to do with how they respond to you, the neighbors, pets, everything else. So, um, if you have real concerns with your neighbors, I would begin to rethink whether or not I should be keeping bees right there. Because different times of the year, your bees change their disposition, they change their defensive levels. And if you have a sensitive issue with any of your neighbors, uh, that can get out of hand. So, but that's my answer to the question. Is it a bad idea to inspections early in the morning, like 6 a.m.? I think uh, it's not optimum for the bees or for you, for all the reasons that I just mentioned. So, question number six. Stoked on Earth is the YouTube channel name. I have a question I came up with after a few years of observation. I know a few live bee removal experts and have received bees from them from time to time. Some of these colonies were thriving for two to four years in all cases without human intervention. Having massive honey stores and healthy hives and comb, but they all had a mite issue, but under control without humans giving any treatment. My question is, why do these colonies survive so well without us getting involved? In most cases, they were Italian queens, three to 10 pounds of bees, and from comb history observed on these wild hives, they all looked to have swarmed multiple times Back to my question, how are they surviving so well? Um, so feral colonies, by the way, are great resources when it comes to looking into the colony, looking into how they arrange themselves, seeing what the entrance size is, and as mentioned here, gauging the age of the colony that occupies that. And one of the things when they're not managed, and we do, because right off the bat, you know, Mr. Ed, Jeff Horchoff, uh, Randy McCaffrey, Dirt Rooster, um, a lot of these guys are doing ripouts have done, you know, over a thousand. I mean, I'm never going to see in a thousand feral colonies, even if we look for them. Uh, so it is very interesting how they arrange themselves. And you frequently hear from people, Hey, there've been bees in this tree uh, ever since I was 10, you know, and you're talking to somebody that's in their forties and uh, there probably have been bees in that tree, but what happens is they cycle out. So in other words, they're requeening themselves sometimes without even departing completely from that hive. They're swarming out, which means they're still occupied, but a queen did leave and took part of that population with her. So what happens is the smaller the space, the more frequently they swarm, the more frequently they swarm, the more frequently they break the brood, more frequently they break the brood, then the fewer varroa destructor mites are reproducing in there. So they have a way of kind of protecting themselves. And the other thing is, unless people are observing these hives full time, daily, you don't always know when they've completely absconded. And then what happens is when you look at the comb, uh, you can see kind of how old the comb is, especially in the brood areas. And often it all looks pretty darn fresh within just a few years of age. So, once they've abandoned it completely, what moves in? What recycles all the old comb? So you're going to get uh, the wax worms. Okay, so the wax moth flies in there, lays a bunch of eggs, wax worms, eat everything up. They'll even eat the oldest, most fibrous, useless comb. And uh, then you'll just see remnants of where the comb had been. And then what happens? Swarms from other colonies come over and occupy that space again and build new combs. So they're refreshing it. And they're also doing things 
that protect it. Uh, they're also covering almost the entire interior with uh, propolis. And when they do that, they're creating a defense for the bees, a health defense. So in other words, kind of a medicated cavity that prevents infection or greatly reduces infection so that the bees don't have to spend all that time defending themselves from disease. So there are a lot of things that benefit the bees when people are not touching that cavity. But I also have questions often when, you know, people say that un, you know, unbothered, not bothered, not inspected, not managed, uh, how long they survive. But they're really cycling out. Dr. Tom Seeley covers this a lot. And we tried to do a thing as a, a beekeeping association where they had a monitoring system where they were going to look at the colonies in bee trees that uh, and monitor them through the years in a meaningful way to see kind of how they do, how long they make it. And they actually weren't making it very long at all. They were not surviving through winters. They were getting, now then the space would get reoccupied in spring, but it would be without a occupying colony of bees going through the winter. So there were periods where these cavities were empty, so they weren't as consistently occupied as a lot of people thought they were. Now let's flip that and, you know, kind of give the argument to the, in the other direction, because this comes up a lot for some reason recently, you know, uh, don't manage the bees, don't touch them, don't do anything. They're going to do fine. They're going to make it on their own. Well, if we look at, uh, again, Dr. Seeley's research in the Arnott Forest in New York, and uh, when the varroa destructor mite showed up on the scene, uh, these wild colonies did not handle the varroa destructor mite. They were wiped out. Uh, and then to a very small percentage, which leaves us to Darwinian beekeeping. Uh, so the idea that the colonies that couldn't manage with mites would die out, those that uh, were the residual genetics that were managing to occupy a hive with mites present uh, became stock that you would look at. This is also the premise for Daniel Weaver uh, down in Bee Weaver in Texas. And uh, he allowed that too. He allowed the mites to destroy all the colonies that they wanted to, and they worked exclusively with those that survived. So there are survivor lines that are still managed by people. So it's not always the fact that people are managing that reduces the chances of the bee. So with the Darwinian beekeeping practice, uh, if you found one that was really overwhelmed with mites, because uh, the other thing was, there was a statement here that says they look like Italian queens. Uh, a lot of the genetics are so hybridized right now. So we don't really know what their origins are. You can see traits that are, you know, very familiar with certain uh, lines of bee stock, races of bees. And, uh, but to find a pure genetic line in feral colonies is pretty rare because remember they're cycling out frequently and uh, the queens are then mating with drones from other colonies. And that's how we kind of get a balanced survivor line in a specific area. And probably the more isolated you are, the better potential you have to get a system set up like that where the bees are kind of making it on their own. Dr. Leo Sharashkin uh, says that in his area, in fact, his method of beekeeping, the hands-off beekeeping with a smile approach, uh, may not work in a lot of other places. And that's because we have the genetic influence of other beekeepers that are in range of our queens when they go out to be mated. Now, where he happens to be, he thinks that he's cycling back his own stock and therefore over the years is improving his genetics and chances to go treatment free. So there's a lot to consider and uh, you'll find out too, three to four years is really not that great. And that's because a lot of beekeepers uh, that start out beekeeping and want to be treatment free and uh, they haven't really thought out all the angles of that, why that works. You find that it takes three years for the negative impacts to build on your bees and for the varroa destructor mites. If you're varroa free at the beginning, uh, for them to start out and uh, start to gain uh, ground against your bees and of course for their populations to rise enough that they become negative uh, to the health of your bees and then by the end of that third year is kind of the sweet spot where you can end up with dead colonies from the diseases vectored by the varroa destructor mites. So three years they can you can you can buy a package today put them in and if they're mite free right now uh, get them going. Now, how do they get the mites in the first place in that hive? 
Guess how many mites it takes to establish a colony of mites in your colony of bees? It takes one. That single mite, just one, has to make it into your hive from drift, from another colony, from robbing out another colony, all the things that help them spread whatever's going on in one colony to another colony. Uh, when a colony dies out and there's mites in there or there's bees that are sick um, and have mites on them, then these robber bees that are strong and they're, they're foraging and they're, they're, they have the power to rob, so they're coming up by the hundreds or even thousands in some cases, and the varroa mites find their ways onto the bodies of those robbing bees, and there they go, back to the colony that was so strong it was capable of sacking other colonies. But now it brought back diseases with it, including the varroa destructor mite. And then that foundress mite starts her reproduction and she starts to take over the new colony. This is why it's so important to know the mite load of the hives under your care because you can be the source of the destruction of lots of other colonies if you have just one or two colonies in your apiary that are overrun with mites. Uh, it's been studied in great detail and the domino effect that occurs through drift from that colony, colonies that would have made it on their own, um, that were somewhat resistant, that were surviving with mites present, found themselves overwhelmed when these colonies that were really heavily loaded began to die out, the robbing, the spreading, and so it went. So there's a lot more to think about than that, but it is, I mean, it's a, it's a rational thing to do, to look at colonies and see them not managed, see them making it year after year and wonder why they do it. Well, we really have to monitor that colony of bees and know for sure that they're consistently present. But remember that the reason the bees are making it in feral colonies in places all over this country except where the environment doesn't support it. There are bees being kept in environments in this country where they simply couldn't make it if they weren't being managed by beekeepers. So we're talking about climates and environments where the bees are making it on their own as feral colonies of bees in old sheds, buildings, trees, any cavity they can find. Um, there's a lot of bees in the area, which means they get re-inhabited fairly quickly uh, all through the productive year. And so bees are trying to reproduce, they're trying to spread themselves out, and the smaller the colony, the more rapidly they reproduce. And uh, so they swarm frequently, and that is their defense. So by swarming and reproducing and starting fresh over and over and over, and then of course the more reproductive cycles they have, the more genetic changes you have and the potential for adaptation. So it stands to reason. Those are my thoughts on why that's happening. Question number seven comes from George, Woodlawn, Tennessee. Just finished watching, I believe, episode 198, though it might be 199. Anywho, I'm starting from scratch and I'm worried about not having any drawn comb. You talked about better comb sold through Better Bee. My question is, do you think it would be beneficial to buy this to give my soon-to-arrive package bees something to work on to hopefully avoid them absconding or swarming from my hives. It is expensive, around $60 for 10 combs. So $6 a comb from Better Bee. Um, here's how I use Better Bee. And if you'll notice Better Bee, here's how I use Better Comb from Better Bee, which is really a company called Hexacell that made it originally. Um, I have boxes of it and I keep them on the shelf and they're my emergency resources. And uh, so the thing is, when you get a package of bees, you have a lot of bees. You have bees that are ready to go, three pounds on average, right? And you've got a queen in there and she's going to be laying and she's going to be productive if you've made your purchase from a reputable um, seller of packages from a reputable breeder that's giving you a good line of bees. So when you put them in there, would I put better comb in there uh, for starting a package? I wouldn't put all of the frames. So for example, again, I'm going to mention what I did to the first question was uh, that I would start them in a smaller box. Now, packages can progress pretty fast, but uh, if you put them in a nuke, five frame, nucleus, hive, five deeps, I don't like the mediums personally, personal choice. Um, then you're gonna find out that they can do a lot more in a lot smaller space and that you're gonna provide them with your sugar syrup, 
all the time to keep them there. And the anchoring point will, of course, be uh, when that queen starts laying her eggs. So she'll come in a cage. Uh, she hopefully gets accepted. She's been traveling with uh, bees in that package that are not related to her nine times out of ten. And so when you put the queen cage in there with them, um, you're going to observe their behavior towards the queen. Hopefully you'll see them sticking their tongues through the cage and feeding the queen, trying to take care of her. Sometimes there are attendant workers in with the queen. And the attendant workers that are in that little queen cage that comes with her, if you can, if you're confident, I would remove those workers from that queen cage before introducing her to the hive. The reason for that is oftentimes when the bees that are in the package that have a negative response to the queen uh, are actually responding negatively to the worker. And this includes requeening or starting with a package. Um, so packages tend to accept queens better because they've traveled with her for two or three days. They're already hopefully feeding her, getting her pheromone spread through direct contact through that package of bees. And, uh, but it's just a safety precaution. You can get rid of the bees that are with her. And the reason for that too is now you can angle your queen cage any way you want. There's no concern about them stinging the workers through the screen and then the workers blocking the hole and preventing the queen from getting out. So how do you get your workers out without losing your queen? You get something like this. Most people don't have these, you know, it, it's called a queen muff or whatever, but you take your queen cage if you had one handy, you know, if I had one handy and queen cage is in your hand and you stick your hand right through the end here. And then now we have access and we can put a knife or something in here and you're going to pull out the cork and you're going to let the workers out. And if the queen comes out too, then you're going to recatch the queen in here and carefully get her alone back into that cage. And then you're going to replace that cork. And then now she's back in here by herself. And then you put that uh, queen cage to do your introduction. And now it doesn't matter what angle the sugar plug is. It can be down, sideways, anything you want. And then when they get the queen out, this is the other thing I want you to think about. We're going to talk about the better comb too, because it's part of my fluff piece also. So, um, when the queen comes out, of course, that starts the production. So once that queen is out, I also want you to know from the person that sold you the package, are these packages mite free? Has there been a treatment? If there hasn't been, I recommend that nine days after you've received that, it's obviously the queen's still in her cage and everything else. Um, that's when you, if there are mites present on those bees, this is your chance to really knock them flat. And you can do oxalic acid vaporization. You can do a single treatment. Um, and why nine days? Because we don't want them to, if the queen starts laying, we don't want them to be capped already. So once they're capped, the oxalic acid doesn't work, which means they're in the pupa state. So with your new package, don't treat them right away because that's a stressor right off the bat. But as they get to the seventh, eighth, ninth day of your package install, that's when you can give them a single treatment. And it's been very effective. And that holds true even for those who this spring will be capturing swarms by the time you hive them. They have no brood, right? You're putting them in a colony, they're gonna build up. Now, the option as to whether or not to use your better comb in there. One of the things that I've just recently read about, and I'll put links down in the video description to these studies, but uh, pollen substitute is something that a lot of people are thinking about because they want to boost their bees in spring. So there are pollen patties and things like that. We don't need to talk about that. But one of the interesting things I noticed, and they were slugging it out, Ultra B wasn't even in the list anymore as one of the top um, dry pollen substitutes. They were using Mega B. And uh, AP23 and Mega B from Better B. AP23 is from Dedant. AP23 just stands for Artificial Pollen Formula 23 and uh, Mega B is a product of Better B. And what they did was they determined which ones caused more longevity in the bees, which one caused a larger brood pattern, in other words, a retention of brood for longer periods, 
and retention of the brood size. So it extended the life of the bees, but uh, and then they had a control, of course, which did not offer any artificial pollen whatsoever. So Mega B was a step up from no pollen at all, and AP23 was 86% more effective than Mega B when they put it in cells and then put the, so the dry pollen sub, which you would normally put out to a pollen feeder or something like that, the foragers go out, they roll around in it, and they bring it back the way normal foragers collect and bring back pollen. But in this test, which I recommend you read it because it's very interesting, they put the dry pollen sub into cells. Now, it sounds like they used cells that were um, already part of drawn comb where I think uh, I immediately thought, wow, we could do that with better bee, better comb, and we could fill that with a dry pollen sub from Daydant, which better bee won't like because they want you to use mega bee, but I recommend AP23 rather than mega bee from better bee, you see? So we stick the AP23 in there, and what the bees did, the nurse bees treated that like pollen that the bees had brought in from the outside, because these nurse bees don't manage pollen. In other words, when the foragers come in with pollen on their corbicula, their hind legs where the little pollen balls are, those field bees are the ones that go directly to the cells and they get all itchy and they scratch off the pollen balls and they just shove them in the cells and then they leave them there. And then nurse bees come along and they start to work that and they amend it, right? So that's why we get fermentation of the pollen. That's why we call it bee bread. That's why it smells interesting. If you have observation hives and things like that, when the bee bread is in high production, you can smell it. It's interesting. Now, so because they are working that dry pollen substitute and causing it to ferment, they also are making it better for metabolism. In other words, the bees then that use it, the nurse bees that are going to feed that to the developing brood are metabolizing it and it shows up in all the bee guts of every bee in the hive. So then they had improved 86%. Now this isn't 86% improved brood overall. This is an 86%, according to the study, improvement of AP23's performance over Mega B. So the actual overall percentage of gain in the hive, the maintenance of the weight of the bees, the size of the colony, blah, 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 was extended by having a dry pollen sub in a period of dearth. So this is a time when they can't get these nutrients from the environment. So I think I'm not going to put it in because I'm, I'm not starting any colonies right now, but it would be fun to see if they use that. And it's very easy to tell because once you put it in the cells, you'll know right away within a week or two, are they using it, consuming it? Because another thought could be, hmm, they're cleaning it up and removing it and just getting it out of there. And people think they're eating it, right? No, because the science group, they smash the bees' guts and they look at it to see where the pollen is, to see where the nutrition levels are. And then they mark the bees and they track the bees to see how long they live. And so if they're living longer with this, then uh, it's a good thing. Now, is that better than real pollen? Not likely. So if they're actually bringing in plenty of pollen, you don't need to boost them. They're going to bring in what they need. But uh, if you have inclement weather coming, you just installed your package, you got a couple of weeks ahead of you of heavy storms, which these days, that can happen at any time. Uh, how cool would it be if you could create a frame of dry pollen sub with your better comb and put that in the hive? Now we've satisfied the sucrose, which is what they're going to need for their carbohydrates for the energy source. And we've provided them with the protein. It's an inferior protein compared to real pollen, but something's better than nothing because if you got these storms coming up, then you're not going to have this provisioning which would help them build their brood, but now you do. What do you think? Does that sound good? Read the study. I think it's cool. I'm going to put a link down there and then you're going to find out that uh, you can do it. But when it comes to the better comb, I don't like fill a hole. Like if I'm starting with a nuke and a half, I've used better comb with that, especially late season swarms and things like that, like the one earlier described, uh, because I want them to work the better comb and I want them to occupy it. 
I only use like, let's say it's a five frame nuke. I would put two frames of better comb in there. And then I juxtapose that. So the first frame is some other frame that's not drawn out yet, then better comb, then another frame not drawn out, then better comb, then another frame not drawn out. So the center frame is a not drawn comb and it's shouldered by two better comb frames, right? Does that make sense? So, and that works really well. And in just a couple of weeks, you can't tell which comb they've built and which comb is from better comb, other than that when you look at the bottom of the frame, the better comb is always drawn out and uh, married completely to the wooden frame, even across the bottom. And the foundationless frames are, they leave an opening across the bottom. It's really interesting. So we're in the fluff section because that's my last question for today. And that's what I wanted to talk about was the dry pollen sub-studies, which are really interesting. And here I was, you know, fooling around with Ultra Bee all this time, which came from Man Lake. I don't know what's happened to their formula. Maybe their formula is just as good as it ever was. And maybe Mega Bee has improved. And then AP23 has improved even on that. So right now, according to the studies that I've read, you may find another one. But uh, the studies that I've read have AP23 on top. And these are current studies within the last year. So very interesting. And the closeout too, after uh, this talk, stick around after the end if you want to see bees in snow because I crawled around in the snow this week and uh, took macro videos. And what it does, it'll make you sad for the bees, but uh, it also gives you a full screen look of the anatomy of the honeybee while they're on the snow. So there are a lot of things you can observe. Uh, they do cleansing flights, they fly out, they land in snow. Some of them land in snow once and stay there and never recover. Others fly out, land in snow, look like they're not going to make it. And then I come along and I lay in the snow and I stare at that bee and I make a video. And then out of the blue, it flies away. Some of the things I notice that the bees are trying to do when they lay in snow. And the reason I'm telling you all this now is I don't want to narrate this video. I want you just to hear the bees, hear the sounds of nature and see what they're doing. But some of the things you'll notice is there's one bee, for example, that its abdomen curled down and its head was pointed down. And it occurred to me that they're trying to keep their thorax off the snow. And the reason they do that is it's the thorax that has to warm up enough for their flight muscles to work so they can fly and get off of the snow. So that's interesting. And uh, you'll also see the anatomy of their legs, the way they respirate. You're going to see a lot of detail in these videos. So I hope you'll spend time and watch it, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, the bees that fly back to the hives are interesting. Now, it, it's another thing that we think about when you're looking at how high to make your hives off the ground. Bees live in trees, you know, in a perfect world. That means they're way off the ground. That means that when they fly out to do a cleansing flight, they're probably landing on another tree somewhere and they're not making it all the way to the ground. So it's unlikely that you would see a little kind of pepper pattern of dead bees in snow in front of a bee tree. Now there would be a couple probably because remember they're also tossing out their dead and dying and sick bees. And the other thing is a lot of people see a bee in snow and think, get that bee, put it back on the landing board and save it. Now, sometimes that works and uh, sometimes it doesn't. That bee just jumps off the landing board again to your frustration, lands in the snow and melts a little hole and disappears. This is part of, remember, your bees are not uh, expiring the way they normally would on warm days, summertime, things like that. The reason in the summertime you don't see a lot of dead bees on your landing board is because they're flying off and they're just not coming back and they're flying way off. They're not just dropping in the the dirt right in front of your hive and that's because the cold weather isn't taking them out so it's very interesting to watch their behavior and they're trying to keep the thorax off the snow it's very interesting but i hope you enjoy those sequences and i hope they're not too sad for you so they're doing a lot of cleansing flights right now the other thing is all the hives all the langstroth style hives had hive alive fondant on them and what i'm used to seeing this time of year especially while there's snow on the ground is all the tan spots in the snow. So some dysentery. And uh, what I notice now that we're doing that, and I can't attribute it 100% to hive alive fondant, but there's no dysentery. In other words, where I would in the past have seen hundreds of little tan spots in the snow where the bees flew out and eliminated as soon as they landed and then they flew again. Um, I might see one lightly uh, 
soiled patch of snow. And so it's very interesting. The bees are healthier this year, it seems. So the other thing is, this is your opportunity to put out uh, pollen feeders. I highly recommend that uh, if you're feeding dry pollen sub, that you don't put that in glass jars. For example, bees fly towards the light and glass jars with pollen sub in them can trap your bees. They just get all covered in pollen and then they just fiddle around in there and then you're gonna wonder why when you look at your pollen feeder, there's a bunch of dead bees. They fly towards the light. So if you've got a covered pollen feeder of some kind, please make sure that it's opaque. No light gets through. So the only light is the entrance and the, uh, the point of egress for your bees so they can get out of there. Try not to use materials that are really smooth and really slick because the pollen dust, pollen sub dust gets all over the interiors and then they can't get their footing and they haven't groomed off their eyes and things like that. So they end up stuck in there. That's why my number one pollen feeder um, kind of receptacle or whatever you want to call it is the egg cartons. And I mean the pressed paper style egg cartons, not the polystyrene ones or styrofoam or whatever they're made of, the paper ones. And you put your dry pollen sub out there and you put it in the same spot every time. And I found that if you put them in a sunny spot, the bees find it quicker. The other thing is please don't leave them out overnight. Don't let dew and dampness, if it's gonna rain, get those inside because your bees aren't gonna be foraging for pollen in the rain anyway. So, and then just put them back out when the weather's good. And don't put them out early in the morning either. Wait until the bees are flying the most, scouts are flying you know, from 11 to three in the afternoon on these, these warm periods that we get. Cold days, lots of sunlight. Whenever you see bee foragers go by, put your pollen sub out and then bring it back in and preserve it. Now what pollen sub would I be putting out? AP23. So that's what I'm gonna try, but right now we don't have the weather to do it, but that's my goal for this year. Now for, what am I doing for the 200th? Um, episode. What am I doing for my viewers? So I, I tried to think of things to do. So all I did was I designed and uh, posted the designs uh, already. There's a, and, and you can enter to win one of these. There's a 32 ounce stainless steel water bottle. That thing is really nice. So what it says on the side, it's got the way to be logo on it. And it says 200th episode. So nothing fancy, but uh, it is a conspicuous label. So if you don't, don't want to advertise uh, this vlog or this YouTube channel or the Podbean podcast, then you probably don't want any of these. But I'm also going to tell you how to enter. So I'm just telling you what you could get. 32 ounce stainless steel bottle, 200th episode coffee mug. There's going to be four of those going out, all different colors, black, yellow, green, gray. So lots of colors for that. And you'll get to say that when you enter. There are also vinyl stickers. Some people collect stickers. I'm not a sticker collector, but I get a lot of requests for stickers. So it's going to be the way to be. Um, logo again with 200 episodes. And the link is going to be down in the video description. And all it is is a link to my page, which is the way to be.org. And you're going to click on the page titled The Way to Be. And then there's a form. It's the very same form that you fill out when you submit a topic for discussion for the Friday Q&As. But instead, you're going to put your name in there and you're going to put uh, the 200th episode uh, contest. You have to write that in the text. 200th episode contest. Now, if you have a preference, if you want a water bottle or a coffee mug or a sticker, if there's something in particular that you want, then include that, right? And there's no race to do it because this contest is going to go on for the whole week. So you have an entire week to submit that. And Friday the 24th is when we're going to announce who the winners are. And then we're going to ship out all those winnings to you. So it's going to be... And the coffee cups and things like that, if somebody didn't win, if you're a loser and... Uh, Although, but if you're a winner, you get them for free. But if you're a loser, uh, you would have to buy them like everyone else. So they are available. All of the items are available for sale for two weeks because, you know, it's a 200th episode offering. So for two weeks, they'll be available. And if you don't buy them or you didn't win one, they disappear. So 
that's it. So you go to the way to be, you follow the link down before, below, you fill it out, and the grand monkeys are going to do the drawing because they're seven years old and they don't care who wins and they're the best people to pick through uh, all the entries and find out who won. And they can even read, so maybe we'll get them to do it on camera if they behave for half a day. And uh, that's it for today. So I want to thank you. If you're one of the people that's been watching me for 200 episodes, thank you for that. And I do appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you who have submitted comments and letting me know that maybe the information that I've put out over these years, these many years, uh, has helped you with your beekeeping. I haven't had one person write and say that they ruined, that I ruined their life somehow. So that's the good news. And so thank you for being with me today. I hope that you can take advantage of the warm weather when it comes and do try to put some dry pollen substitute out and uh, see if your bees can take that since the trees and other things may not have kicked in yet. And it's also a great opportunity to look at your bees and see how they collect and arrange pollen on their bodies. Fascinating stuff. So thanks for being here. Please stay tuned if you wanna watch Bees in Snow. Have a fantastic weekend.